So let's turn our attention now to tumors. Um, we will talk about both malignant and benign tumors in the parotid submandibular and um, sublingual gland. This, this chart will, uh, will outline what the frequency is of, the, uh, of malignant and benign tumors in each of these glands. So in the parotid gland, the vast majority of the tumors we encounter are benign, thankfully. 80% benign within the parotid gland. But when we move to the submandibular gland, it's 50-50. Only about half of them are benign. Once we get to the sublingual and also the minor salivary glands, that ratio has reversed from the parotid, and now 80% are malignant, and only 20% of these uh, tumors are benign. So what sort of tumors, what sort of histopathology are we encountering when we encounter salivary tumors? Well, in the benign category, there is a long list of tumors. But there are two that I think are really worth knowing the most about. Pleomorphic adenomas and Worthen's tumors. That's why they're highlighted here. There are many others. Adenomas, oncocytomas, oncocytic papillary cyst adenomas, and the list goes on and on beyond what I have put here. But the two that are most important are pleomorphic adenoma and Worthen's tumors. Similarly, on the malignant side, there is a long list, an even longer list, of potential malignant tumors. But there are two that I think that are worth focusing on, mucoepidermoid carcinoma and adenoid cystic carcinoma, so we'll talk about those two. We'll mention briefly carcinoma ex pleomorphic adenoma because it's an important concept, but um, these two are the two most common and the ones worth studying the most. So first, pleomorphic adenoma, our most common benign tumor. It has a, um, a synonym, benign mixed tumor. It generally uh, affects females over the age of 40, a cluster of grapes appearance. Here is a, a standard appearance for a pleomorphic adenoma, well-defined heterogeneous enhancement um, within the superficial lobe of the parotid. Here's a much larger tumor, and you might wonder how we know this is a pleomorphic adenoma. Well, it's difficult to be certain. This tumor is bright on T2, but not brighter than CSF, so it's not super bright, not that specific sign. But this gap right here, in between the mandible and the styloid process, the stylomandibular tunnel, this tumor is extending through the stylomandibular tunnel, and that is a good clue that you are dealing with a pleomorphic adenoma. It is a clue. It's not absolute, but it is a clue. Here's another example of a mass extending through that stylomandibular tunnel. Although most of the mass is in the deep uh, lobe, it is extending through that stylomandibular tunnel. Now, this lesion is so bright on T2, it is in fact brighter than the CSF. This is almost certainly a pleomorphic adenoma because of its benign appearance, that extension through the tunnel, and in particular, that bright T2 signal. Here's what it looks like when it recurs. Uh, when a pleomorphic adenoma recurs, there are in innumerable tiny foci everywhere of recurrent tumor, and those are those little tendrils of, of tumor that were not completely resected. So let's turn our attention to Worthen's tumor. Uh, Worthen's tumor also has some synonyms, adenolymphoma, papillary cyst adenoma, lymphomatosum. Worthen's tumor is famous for being multifocal. We think of the, uh, as it being multifocal. But in fact, only 15% of Worthen's tumors are multifocal. They may be bilateral, they may be multiple in the same gland, but only 15%. It's famous for that because not much else is multifocal, but in fact, it's a minority of these tumors. Worthen's tumor undergoes cystic degeneration, and it can be detected using uh, protectinate scans, although we don't often use those for that purpose. Here's a characteristic appearance of a Worthen's tumor. It does not enhance it as a cystic appearance centrally, but again, a very well-defined tumor. Uh, here is an example on MRI. Uh, this, because these are cystic, they have a possibility of becoming superinfected, as in this case, you can see all the surrounding inflammation. Now, this is an example of a multifocal tumor. Again, it's a minority of cases that end up being multifocal, but this patient had multiple uh, examples of Worthen's tumor within a single gland. On to the malignancies. Mucoepidermoid carcinoma is the most common malignancy to affect the parotid gland. Although adenoid cystic is more common in the smaller glands, the parotid gland most commonly mucoepidermoid carcinoma. It comes in two forms. There is a high-grade form and a low-grade form. And the prognosis of the tumor is related to that grade. It's 30% uh, five-year survival for a high-grade tumor, but 90% five-year survival for a low-grade tumor. You can tell these apart radiologically by how infiltrative the tumor is. An infiltrative, aggressive-appearing tumor is a high-grade tumor, but a well-circumscribed tumor is a low-grade tumor. 
Um, there is a high risk of metastatic disease from mucoepidermoid carcinoma such that routinely a neck dissection will be performed even if there is no radiologic or clinical evidence of a metastatic disease. Um, these can undergo cystic degeneration and calcification, although it is uncommon, and they characteristically have a low T1 signal and a variable T2 signal depending on the grade. The lower the T2 signal, the higher the grade of the tumor. So here's an example of a well-defined mucoepidermoid carcinoma, and this is likely to be a low-grade tumor. Here's another example on MRI, very well-defined, uniformly enhancing, a low-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Here's an example of a very aggressive tumor with infiltrative disease all through the gland, deep lobe, superficial lobe. This is what a high-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma characteristically looks like. Let's look at another uh, histopathology, the adenoid cystic carcinoma. Adenoid cystic carcinoma is famous for its propensity to perineural invasion, and rightly so. It really has a strong propensity to that. Uh, lymphoma is the other disease that tends to do that. Unfortunately, adenoid cystic carcinoma is essentially incurable. However, these tumors can undergo a very prolonged remission, and patients who are, get local regional control may go for 10, 20 years, far longer than most of the tumors that we treat, without evidence of recurrent disease. When this disease does recur, it tends to be as uh, distant lung metastases. So here is a characteristic example of an adenoid cystic carcinoma, very infiltrative, very angry appearance. I want to particularly note this spread medially along a nerve called the auriculotemporal nerve. The auriculotemporal nerve is a branch of the fifth cranial nerve. So the fifth cranial nerve comes down through foramen ovale and comes across the infratemporal fossa. As it's doing that, headed, V3 is headed towards the mandible. It gives off a very important branch, the auriculotemporal nerve. That branch comes comes laterally behind the mandible, behind the uh, neck of the condyle, and then enters the parotid gland and feeds the skin overlying the parotid gland. Now we like to think that perineural spread of, of tumor comes along the facial nerve. So we like to think of, of perineural spread as coming along the uh, facial nerve. But an alternate way that, of perineural spread for an adenoid cystic carcinoma of the parotid gland is to instead come medially along the auriculotemporal nerve and then crawl up along V3 into Meckel's cave. So uh, that is an alternate way for uh, uh, adenoid cystic carcinoma or other tumors of the parotid gland to reach the intracranial vault. And so uh, here's an example of that perineural spread where we've gone from the auriculotemporal nerve into V3 up through foramen ovale, and there is even a nodular enhancement within Meckel's cave uh, um, indicating spread of disease. I want to show another example of perineural spread from an adenoid cystic carcinoma, this time along V2 through foramen ovale. You can really see it along its length on these axial images. Um, another example of perineural spread, this time back more classically along the facial nerve. When you see tumor filling up the stylomastoid foramen like that, make sure you check along the course of the facial nerve to see if there's enhancement along that vertical segment or even further along for perineural spread of disease. Yet another example of perineural spread, this time along the third branches of the third cranial nerve coming through the superior orbital foramen and into the orbit. And here's an example of the classic appearance of cannonball metastases uh, throughout the lung, a characteristic way for this tumor to recur, often after a long remission. So let's talk about masses that arise within the salivary glands but are not of salivary origin. Uh, lipomas are very common, and they are an easy diagnosis to make when, once you recognize them as fat-containing. Uh, hemangiomas are surprisingly common, uh, venous malformations, hemangiomas surprisingly common within the parotid gland. They are most easily identified by their brisk enhancement. If you can find phleboliths, that's another great clue. Lymphoma can arise as a primary disease within the parotid gland and usually affects more than one lymph node. Remember that the parotid gland is unique, that it has lymph nodes, so lymphoma occurs within only the parotid gland, and it's usually multifocal, multiple nodes within the gland, and that is a good clue to that diagnosis. Metastases can come from anywhere in the body uh, to this area. This happens to be a renal cell carcinoma. I, you would never have predicted such a thing, uh, metastasizing to the parotid gland, to a lymph node within the parotid gland. So uh, looking back on salivary tumors before we move on, uh, a solitary mass 
is, uh, is either a benign, is usually going to be a benign or malignant tumor. Pleomorphic adenoma is the most common benign tumor. Adenoid cystic carcinoma, the most common malignant tumor, except in the parotid gland where mucoepidermoid carcinoma comes out a little bit ahead. Multifocal masses, on the other hand, you have a different differential diagnosis. Think about Worthen's tumors, think about lymphomas, think about metastatic disease for multifocal masses. One of the, unfortunately, it's very difficult for us to distinguish between all of these things. You'll notice that many of the pictures I showed you looked very much alike. It's very hard to distinguish these different um, diseases. Sometimes a very aggressive tumor, we know it's a malignancy, but often we cannot come up with a specific diagnosis. To make a specific diagnosis, we require tissue sampling. 